Okay, gentlemen. Thank you. So now we have all eaten, can we give it up and a big round of applause for our standing chef, Darren Vardy? Go on, Dad. Uh, absolute great work, especially. Con what? It, it was very good, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I agree, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, an, an amazing job done by Dad's, considering he was standing in as well. So, thanks very much. And on that note, just remind everyone as our food digests uh, and we find out how good his cooking was that the toilets are just through that way. Now, you haven't come here tonight um, to listen to me and my Christmas cracker jokes, so I'm going to introduce our guest speaker. Now, I had the pleasure of meeting Simon um, and having a good chat with him when he came down with Joe Rogers the other month. Um, and even in the few minutes that we spoke, I was just absolutely mesmerised um, about what Simon had to say and how Christ's been working in his life. So I cannot wait to hear the full story and hear how the Lord has been working in your life. So if you'd like to join me in giving a huge round of applause to Simon and welcome him up to the front. Thank you. I can't wait to hear what I've got to say after that introduction. Um, well, it's good to be here. And yeah, and it was a couple of months ago I was here with Joe Rogers and... Uh, um, Joe was on the program that I run. It was it's called the Oaks program. We're just closing, actually. We just I was just telling the guys on my table. We're just finishing the project, which we started seven years ago. Ironically, someone told me seven years ago, "Don't be surprised if this season only lasts seven years." So, but, but God knows the beginning from the end, doesn't he? He really, really does. Uh, I love the scripture. Um, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. You know, from Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans for a hope in the future, not for calamity. And when you seek me with all your heart, you'll find me. I like to switch that scripture around, actually. When you seek me with all your heart, you will find me, for I know the plans I have for you. It kind of works really well that way. I've often wondered if I got a chance at doing scripture, I would rewrite that one. Um, because it's often the, one, the bit that's not mentioned at the end of it. It's like, oh, I love that, plans. And I know that was for a context for the people of Israel when they were in Babylon. But actually, I've found that God does have a plan and purpose for our lives, or plans and purposes, should I say, because there are many different seasons in life, aren't there? So my name's Simon Sullivan. I was born in 1969 in a place called Withinshaw, South Manchester. And uh, my mum was 15. She was in care when she had me. Uh, she had a very, very traumatic upbringing, brought up by uh, a mother who was um, into prostitution and a father who was a drunken schizophrenic. So I'm from really good stock, as you can tell. And uh, you're a tough crowd, you like, that was a joke, you know, feel free. <laughs> We're not in a courtroom, you know. Um, but that was my beginning. So I know that God has a plan and purpose for our lives. Because I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I should be following the footsteps of what my father did. And so my dad was part of a family that lived just across the road from this children's home my mum was in. And there was about 10 kids. And... Uh, just a house full of children. They'd come over from Ireland. And uh, my dad was a career criminal. Even at that age when he met my mum. He was 20, she was 15. He got in trouble for that as well. Because, of course, I came from that relationship. And uh, uh, I only found that out recently when I was looking through his uh, criminal record. I had to for some other reason. I had to look through his criminal record. <laughs> I only found that out. He got done for that. But, you know, you know but then again, sort of, you know, from bad things, God creates beautiful things, doesn't he? From broken, sort of master, from broken things, he makes beautiful mosaics, doesn't he? And I think I'd rather be a mosaic than a beautiful, pristine, white-tiled bathroom. So, um, but that's our story, isn't it, as Christians? We're mosaics. God gets broken people, broken things, and he makes something wonderful and unique one-off out of it. Not like factory-made white black tiles, you know. That's what he doesn't, he doesn't do that. He does unique things. So anyway, my mum was, uh, like I say, she was 15. And uh, she had to uh, then move out of care once she turned 16. I was a baby. And in those days, there wasn't the care system you had now. You had to find somewhere to live and get yourself a job. So, of course, he was in prison by this time, my dad. He was doing a long sentence. And uh, my mum was on her own. 
And, uh, and this is a story I only found out a few years ago. And let me give you a reason why I'm telling you this story. When I moved to the Oaks seven years ago, this big house in Withenshaw, it was an old, it was an old, old folks home. But a very rich guy came and heard our story of what we wanted to do. He wanted to work with people coming out of prison, coming out of um, addiction, and really teach them how to live life, to, to be a discipleship home, and to be a place where they could be family. Because that's where you learn to do things, family. And it doesn't matter what age, you will learn to do things in family, where there's accountability, where there's people you hold, holding you accountable. That's, that's why most addiction thrives with no accountability. But where there's a lot of accountability, addiction kind of, it kind of, what's the best word? It fades. Why? Because you've got relationship and accountability and responsibility. But anyway, so I wanted to do this program and, uh, and we needed this big house and we, we got our eyes on it and we knew God was going to provide it. But a, a fella turned up and a rich guy from, from up north, we told him our story and he gave us the money we needed to buy the house, 250 grand at the time. But anyway, the reason I'm telling you this is because... When we, so it was the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords who got us the house, really. I mean, I know a guy gave money, but we'd been praying for it and we knew that God would provide. We just didn't know how. And this guy turns up and he did. When I got that house seven years ago, and I'm just kind of fast forwarding, but I'm going to go back. When we got that house seven years ago, I told my mum about it. And uh, I didn't think she'd be very happy that I was moving back to where my roots were, um, which I'll come to in a bit as why we moved away and stuff like that. And she said, you know what, I forgot to tell you a story. Um, when I was 15, and she told me this story, and she was 15, she had to move out of care. She said, well, I moved in with some foster carers who'd fostered me a few years before, and they let me sleep on the settee and sofa surf. I was 16 by now, and you were a baby, so you'd sleep next to me. She said, but it was only temporary. But someone said to me, write to the Queen. And uh, she said, so I had a mad moment, I wrote to the Queen. And she wrote to the Queen, she said, Dear Queen Elizabeth, my name's Barbara Smith. She said, I haven't got, a, I haven't got any family. Uh, I've got a little baby. I haven't got a job. I haven't got a home. I've got, I've got nothing. No one to look after me. No one to help me. And uh, I think the country should help me. Can you do anything for me? Anyway, uh, you know, to maybe one or two weeks later, she got a reply from uh, Her Majesty's aides, as it probably would have been. And they said, Her Majesty agrees that we should help you. And uh, not one of her subjects should have to go through what you're going through. As a result, take yourself to such and such a place and you're going to get a set of keys to a house. We got, we got a house given to us, 19, this would be 70, 1970 probably, in Withenshaw, just down the road from the Oaks that I opened up. And uh, I just, I, I said, why did you never tell me that story before? That's such a significant story. She said, oh, I forgot. <laughs> because, it was, because it was years ago and so many things had happened. But anyway... Well, uh, so we got this house, and um, she moved into this house. Oh, I actually wrote back to the, I actually wrote to the Queen when we got the Oaks, actually, and I just said, dear Queen Elizabeth, you won't probably remember this, but many years ago, you sowed a seed, and that seed has borne fruit, because in those days, you gave my mum, Barbara Smith, a house when she was just a young girl and she had nowhere, and now, many years later, it's come to fruition, because I now am running a house of people that haven't got a house of their own. And I just want you to know how thankful we are, but also the seed that you've sown has borne fruit. I wanted her to know the story. I wanted her to know there's something good she'd done. Because don't we all want to know that? If you, if you give some money to someone, wouldn't it be great if you learned a few years later what happened with it, how great things came of it? So I, and I, got, I got a letter back as well. And it just said, you know, it, I'm, Her Majesty is pleased that your mum, Barbara, blah, blah, blah. And it went on like that. And then, do you know what else? They invited me for tea. No, they didn't. That's a joke, that bit. But the rest of it's true. <laughs> I didn't. I, I wish they would have. I was wanting something a bit more intimate. I wanted it to say, oh, come down. I want to talk about this. But of course, it didn't. But I, I hope she heard the story and was pleased and thank God for it because she was a good Christian lady. So uh, there's my royalty story. A good season to tell it as well, isn't it? I actually did. I actually talked about that on UCB radio a few months ago, actually, because um, someone heard the story and they invited me and they said, oh, you know, it's this, it was the Jubilee uh, just earlier. And uh, I think it was Ruth. You know, anyone listen to UCB too? Ruth O'Reilly? Yeah, really good show, really good. She's a great woman, actually. And she said, I want you to tell that story. I told that on the air. So anyway, so we got this house. Uh, but the problem was, was her father eventually found out where we were. And he tried to burn the house down and attack us and all kinds. So we had to escape. And we never went back. But we went to another place called Marple. I was just telling him, um, what, so what's your name? 
I was just telling Ricky actually a bit of this story. It just came up naturally in conversation. So we went away to a place called Marple and where my life changed dramatically. My mum was au pairing, so she moved with her family and suddenly I had three stepbrothers and we brought up there. And, uh, you know, you can take the kid out of... Uh, I don't know if you're aware of Withenshaw. Withenshaw was very, very rough. It was renowned to be one of the biggest council estates in Europe and roughest. And it was. I worked in prison 10 years and uh, most of the lads I met, the younger ones, the juveniles, were from Withenshaw, which is really ironic. Um, but I think this is all part of God's plan. You, you know, he, I, I love this saying, God prepares us for what he's got prepared for us. God prepares us for what he's got prepared for us. He said, I never knew I'd work in prison, you see. So, but that's another story we'll come to later. So uh, moved, back, moved into Marple, spent the next sort of 15 or so years there. And these were years of chaos, drugs, glue sniffing, gas sniffing, all that kind of stuff, which, you see, you, you can take the kid out of the, the estate, but you, it's not as easy to get the estate out of the kid. And because I joined this sort of uh, affluent family, but I was uh, an absolute tear away, a problem child. And I'd look, and in those days, you, you, I mean, you, most of you know, but we didn't have ADHD and A to Z and a every other thing you given to us when we were young, did we? You just went to the the thick teacher who helped you, you know, and because you were a thicko, you know, that's what you were classed as. So you know, you went in a little cabin next to the school where someone would help you. So I went to all those things, I and mean, my behaviour was wild. Um, and I think what it is was because of what I'd been through and witnessed, because there's a lot that I couldn't tell you, but there was a lot of things that my mum went through, which I was there and part of trauma and stuff like that, all kinds of stuff happened during those years, those first three years. But God took us out of that. Um, we weren't Christians, my mum wasn't a Christian, uh, but she had a, she did have someone in the family who was a Christian, I believe they were praying for us. Um, because I've, I always, even before I was a Christian in those days, I always had a sense of something else. Never been an atheist. <laughs> it just didn't make sense to me. I just always had a sense of something, someone else, something else out there directing me and saving me. Because, you know, I suppose like most of you in here, you know, I should have had lots of accidents and lots of near-death experiences and lots of stupid things happened in my life. But when I look back, but for the hand of God saving me and directing me and just taking me out of situations. Without me, there's another saying, God does more behind our backs than in front of our faces. And he certainly did a lot behind my back, which I now look back on. And I can see the hand of God on my life. And, you know, I'm not special. My story backs that up, doesn't it? But all of us, this is the same God we serve who has a plan and purpose for our lives, who prepares us for what he's got prepared for us. But I was an all or nothing guy. You know, if I did something wrong, it was a right royal mess. I wasn't someone that did things by halves. And that kind of worked for me in the end because <laughs> I think sometimes we need a little bit of that into us because actually becoming a Christian is, it is a risk, isn't it? To give up your old life to follow a way that you can not see, totally understand, but just kind of perceive or sense. But anyway, that was an all or nothing, but that helped me on the road to Christianity, which I'll come to. So I went into the punk rock music and all that, got into bands, punk bands and all the rest of it and did all that kind of stuff. And then I uh, fell in love at 17 with this girl I met in a club in Manchester. We were at a punk gig in Manchester, a club called The International. It's not there anymore. It's a big, massive... Um, it's, uh, it's a big fruit and veg, massive fruit and veg supermarket now. I went past it the other week. But I met my wife in there. And I shouldn't have been at the gig, and she shouldn't have been at the gig. It wasn't a gig of a band I liked. It was just, it was just a night out. It was a Friday night. And uh, I was just out just to have some fun. And I met, I'd met this guy on the bus who we'd been chatting about music, and he just introduced me to his sister. And, uh, you know, we sort of we fell in love very, very quickly. And... Uh, Within a year, we were moving in together in a place called Hazel Grove. I was 17. I thought I'd cracked it. I thought I had everything a young man could want. I had a girl who was a few years older than me. I had a house. We could smoke weed in the front room, drink cheap Lambrusco and watch all kinds of sordid things on telly. I thought I had everything. And, uh, but actually, because those things, you know, the, you reap what you sow, don't you? The Bible says that if you sow to the Spirit, in other words, if you do the things that please God... You're going to feel great about life. You're going to be full of joy, peace, and all those kind of things generally. But if you sow to the carnal, horrible old nature, which is kind of autonomous from God, 
then it says that we reap all kinds of destruction and all that kind of stuff. And I had a fair bit of destruction in my life. I got in trouble with the police when I was first 11. I, mean, mom, I think my mum thought I was going the same way as my dad. Fortunately, I didn't get in trouble again. I did a few naughty things after that, but I didn't go that way of my dad. I must have took after my mum, or she did a good job of parenting me. I always say I have the best mum in the world. But, you know, she was a kid when she brought me up. She was 15 herself. She, she'd not even been brought up herself. That's part of the problem, isn't it? And I see so much of that in Withinshaw, where we live. Isn't it, Chris? So many young mothers, children who are bringing up children. And uh, that was what was a product of. But thank God, thank God that he has a plan and purpose. So um, moved in with her. And, of course, all kinds of stuff started to happen to us because we weren't living wholesome lives. We were living lives full of chaos. And chaos breeds more chaos, doesn't it? What's that saying? So a thought, reap an action. So an action, reap a habit. So a habit, reap a destiny. That's how I was living. And I was, and my destiny was starting to, I, was start, I think I was starting to realize that this is all going to crash in around me because I've, I've always hurt the people I love most. This ain't going to last. And then we met some born again Christians. Well, that's the first time I'd really heard of the term born again Christian. See, I went to a Catholic school. And uh, although I wasn't Catholic, Protestant or anything, I had no idea what all that meant. I really wasn't interested in it. But I did have a sense of God. I'd always prayed, especially when I got in trouble. And that was often. So I had a great prayer life um, growing up as a non-Christian. Um, but God hears, God hears us, doesn't he? He listens. He hears it all. And I think the very fact that I was praying wasn't because I was in trouble. It was because God had shown himself to me at some point in my young life growing up. That sense of someone else, I think, was God's just shadow over me in one sense. So um, we met Lee and Sue. They'd become a Christians a year earlier, and they'd sorted their lives out. I mean, they'd been punks like us, but he was an atheist um, communist, actually. He was, a, he was actually the leader of the Stockport Communist Party. <laughs> I, I, there can't have been many of them, because I'd never heard of the Stockport Communist Party. But he said he was the leader of the Stockport Communist Party. But he was in the bath one night, and he heard God speak to him. Not audibly. And that was through his next-door neighbor, who had been a drug-taking witch, a Satanism, and all that kind of stuff. And he got saved while he tried to commit suicide. And then he led Lee and Sue to the Lord, who lived around the corner from us. And then we moved in, this other chaotic couple around the other corner. God was saving everyone in that actually little cul-de-sac at the time. It was all rented houses. But God moves in some of the grimiest places, doesn't he? Anyway, we were... They used to come around and tell us about Jesus and we didn't mind their company because we were lonely and we didn't have anything to do. We had no babysitters either so it was great having them coming around and they told us about Jesus and, and I, could do this, I could do the talks. I loved the talks. I could talk to any because I was fascinated with it. Uh, but actually something funny happened. I suddenly got worse. You see, Jane, my wife now, who was my girlfriend at the time, now remember we're living together at this point in sin. Sin. <laughs> we were living together and we were, just, we were just trying to find ourselves in life. And I remember they used to come round and they treated us like royalty. Never, never ever told us what we were like or anything like that. Loved us. And that for me, that acceptance made me feel secure with them. And because I felt secure with them, I opened up with them and talked to them. But what happened was Jane became a Christian. And I, hadn't, I didn't realize she'd become a Christian. You know, I, I didn't really sort of really fully understand everything. Um, but she said, Simon, let's say this prayer together and ask the Lord Jesus to come into our lives and, you know, fill us and uh, ask him into your heart and all this stuff. And I was like, whoa, 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 stop preaching at me. <laughs> if Jane told me about it, I'd, be, I'd, put the, I'd put the walls up. But when Lee and Sue spoke to me, I was as nice as pie to them, you know, because they were outsiders and I wanted to, to look good in front of them. But when they'd gone, I'd be like, thinking brainwashed hippies them too but the conflict was in me because I believed them and yet something didn't want to believe something was hanging on for dear life to not believe and uh, anyway it was an Easter Sunday it was 1988 I remember it like it was yesterday why because God's mercies are new every morning and I remember this day like it was yesterday so I was supposed to be practicing with my punk band at the time, but it was cancelled. And uh, Jane said, can we go to the church with Lee and Sue? They've been inviting us for two months now. And uh, bear in mind, she'd become a Christian, but she hadn't been to church yet. She wouldn't go without me. 
But she'd become a Christian and she was reading this little Gideon Bible occasionally and she was telling me what I was doing wrong all the time. So, oh, oh, so the Bible says, oh, yeah, the Bible says, oh, do not take the name of the Lord in vain. You're swearing, you can't do it. And I was like, stop effing preaching at me. And I mean, I was filthy. You know, when I, when I became a Christian, I lost 75% of my vocabulary. So I was just like, blah, 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 all this garbage coming out. But it was frustration. I didn't hate God. I might have looked on the outside like I was not going to become a Christian because Lee and Sue told me some years later. They said, Simon, when you, we knew Jamie would become a Christian straight away. She said, but we had no hope for you. <laughs> and I went, really? But isn't it funny? Because the Bible says that man sees on the, what's on the outside, but God sees the heart. You see, I would have never have, if they would have told me that, then I would have gone, no way, I'm really open to this stuff. But you forget just how you can come across, can't you? So don't be put off when people are rude to you when you tell them about Jesus. Because you don't know what God's doing on the inside with that. Because when someone's been horrible, when someone gives you a load of grief and you Bible bashing, beep, 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 actually, something is reacting inside. And that's the reaction that should happen, actually, shouldn't it? Light and dark is hitting. Boom. So there has to be a manifestation of the darkness. And that actually helps the person who's manifesting it to realize that, hang on a sec, why am I doing this? Because that's what started to happen. I started to realize, I started to think, why am I so, why do I say the things I say? Why am I doing all this? Why am I antagonistic towards this message? I want this. And I prayed a few times in bed at night. Jesus, come into my life, forgive me sins. And then I just felt, oh, this is daft. This I feel like I'm making an insurance policy to get to heaven. It just didn't feel natural for me. I felt I was doing it because Jane wanted me to. But Easter Sunday, 1988. I can't remember what we did the night before, but my band practice was cancelled. What time do you want me to finish, by the way? <laughs> I can talk, you know, so you better say something. Okay, I'll take advantage of these no boundaries. Um, so <laughs> we, we had a huge row in the morning because she said, come to church. And I went, yeah, okay. And she was like, what? I said, yeah, all right. So she went skipping down the stairs, brought up a big tray of breakfast in bed, put it on my lap, and she's getting ready, putting her makeup on, and she's like, <laughs> anyway, I ate my breakfast in bed, and then I just went back to sleep. And she comes up and she said, uh, what are you doing? I said, ah, oh, can't be, but I didn't say it these ways. I mean, every, when I say all this, there was a lot more effort than Jeffing, but I'll say it in a nice Christian way. I said, I can't be bothered. And she said, what? I said, I'm not going now. And then she slammed the door, stormed off downstairs. And I start chuckling to myself because I thought I was funny doing this. Anyway, a second later, and I think I'm dozing off, I heard, and all of a sudden the door whacked open against the bed I was in because the door would, would hit the bed if you push it too hard. It slammed against the bed. I jumped up. I said, what were you doing? And she said, you know what? She said, it's the devil keeping you in that bed. And just looked at me like that. And I went. And so I got under the covers. Started throwing them up in the air. Said, oh, the devil's got me in a headlock, Jane. He won't let me out of the bed. Anyway, she just slammed the door. Walked off in disgust and called me a pig. Didn't swear or anything. But it was that moment where I flicked, took the covers off me. And I, thought, I said, almost in my mind, I said, Lord. I believe in all this. I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't know why I do these things. Lord, I'm, I'm sorry. So I, I got all my regalia on. And I tell you, we look like the Adams family. Jane had hair that went right up and back, makeup all around there. She looked like Morticia. And I looked like Lurch. I had bleached white spiky hair and bleached denims and all that. And we thought they were weird. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it, how when you're in the darkness, you twist it round and think that you're in the right and the people of the light are in the wrong. It's a deception, isn't it, that we carry um, but anyway, so we went, to, we went to church after this row, and uh, I'm walking to church, and I'm so nervous. I'm like, oh, no, oh, no. It almost felt like I was going to the guillotine. And uh, I remember we, we walked, and it was only across the road from us, actually. Just literally, it was, it was about a two-minute walk max. And we got to this church, a full gospel church. I'd never been to one of these sort of clappy churches before. And all I'm thinking of is, what are they going to do to me? What are they going to do to me? <laughs> Isn't it funny that, you know, I don't know, I got up to all kinds of stuff, got on pub tables and all kinds of stupid things, and I was frightened to go into a church. Isn't it weird how you can be so frightened of good things and yet do a whole lot of evil and have no fear? Got to this church. Anyway, I walked into, and you know, it's so important that you're greeted, isn't it? Or, or how you're greeted, because when I got to the church, um, this old fellow was there. 
and he just put out his hand and he just got my hand and he just shook my hand and he went, God bless you. So an old fella, probably dead now, and his eyes filled with water as if, as if like he was looking at a grandson who was lost. And that was the first thing that opened me up. This opened my heart right up. And it, just like I'm not letting go of your hand yeah. now, and you're starting to feel uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, this is exactly how I felt. He wouldn't let go of my hand. And he's saying, God bless you, son. You're welcome here. See, they must have known who I was. He must have been, Lee and Sue must have been telling them, pray for Simon and Jane, this couple around the corner. Uh, we didn't know that. But he's just, he's just holding my hand. And then eventually I just went limp like that. And I went, oh, God bless you too. And I just walked in. And all I'm thinking of is like, oh, no, I hope that doesn't happen again. But it was beautiful. And it was uncomfortable at the same time. But the Bible says, you know, you, you can't make the gospel easy and nice. You can't. It's always going to offend. It's always going to be uncomfortable. Why? Because light's hitting darkness. But we can't fear that. Because it's in that that God does an amazing work. You have to sometimes go through the valley first, don't you? Anyway, uh, I, I mean, I just remember thinking, why did I just say, God bless you? I don't say things like that. I'm like, I'm a punk rocker. I don't say things like that. Sat down on the chair. The service started. And then it just went from bad to worse. I'm not kidding. A woman, two seats to the left of me. So we sat with Lee and Sue, our friends, because it makes us feel like secure because no one's going to do anything while they're with us and they're going to help us. You know, that's what it's like. Stick close to them. And then a woman kicks off her shoes and starts dancing in church. Seriously. Dancing in church. Now, bear in mind, I'd been to Catholic school. I'd been to masses. I'd not been to a lively, what we call a lively church, charismatic church. I, I'd, never, I'd never really seen anything like this. And I just, I, I, I said to Jane, I said, fancy us sitting next to the nutter? I actually thought she would just been let out for the day or something. And Christians can't dance, can they? Have you noticed this? <laughs> well, we stopped going to discos, didn't we? That's the problem, isn't it? We don't know how to dance. <laughs> and she was doing this. And I was like, what the flipping heck is this? Actually, she became our biggest encourager. She really did. She became like a mother to us, that lady. And she modeled passion. She modeled faith and she encouraged. And actually, so don't worry about what people think because, uh, well, to a certain extent, yeah. But not to the point, because the thing is, is God will do what he's going to do. If you're praying for someone and you're doing your best, that's all you can do. I won't worry about things like that. Because actually, it, it has two effects on people. One, yeah, it does make them feel uncomfortable. But two, it makes them ask the question, well, there must be something to this. Why would she do that? Because I, that's what I was asking. What is, make, what is, this is good. Now, when I'm in that church, it felt like an electric circuit board. It felt like all the people were the components and electricity was going through it. And as I'm sat there, I'm just feeling God is in this place. God is in this place. I can feel it. It's in the air. It's in the music. It's in the people. I mean, this, this was 88. They had a brass band and an electric band together. You, 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 what, you got a brass section, sorry. They had a brass section, and they were all kids and young people. I mean, there was older and families there, but there was lots of young people there, and they were all in the band, electric guitar, bass, drums, brass section, piano. And I'm like, and this was well before Hill Songs. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, Wow, this is how it should be. This is, this is a non-Christian. This is how it should be. I knew there was something about that that was real. I knew it was genuine. Anyway, during the service, the guy preached, and I don't remember anything he said, but I remember how I felt. I felt loved, accepted, and I felt like I was, I was being confronted with truth, security, and a way that, 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 that would give you something. Salvation. You know, I knew there was something there. So during that service, he said, let us pray. And, well, that was easy for me because I've been in churches where you pray. So I just put my head down and said, Jesus, I'm sick of hurting the people I love most in life. That's all I've ever done. And I don't want to do it anymore. And even with this relationship with Jane now, it's, it's falling apart. I can, you know, everything's falling apart. And because uh, loads of other things that I won't mention had happened. And I, I just thought, I, I, don't, I can't live with myself. I just said, Jesus, if you'll have me, please give me what these people have got. Because... I need you, and I need to change, and I want this. I think that day I saw what I never realized I'd always been looking for. Does that make sense? I saw what I never realized I'd always been looking for. Because for someone like me, I needed security. That was the greatest vacuum in my life, security. 
And that day, I could see security. Not in my head, but looking back, you know, and I didn't know what I was experiencing at the time, but I knew that God was there. And uh, anyway, got up to from praying and whatever and the, the service went on and then finished and all I'm thinking of because I used to smoke in those days all I'm thinking of is I need to get on and have a cigarette because I've been in here it feels like about five hours it's probably only about an hour and a half I loved it was totally uncomfortable and was desperate for a cigarette just a clash of emotions going on so at the end I said Jane come on let's go quickly you know before someone else grabs a hold of me and starts shaking my hand and uh, I opened the door for Jane to walk I mean she wanted to stay but of course I was like no we're going and I opened the door for Jane. And I don't remember what it was like when I went into the church at the beginning. I don't remember that part, other than, you know, typical moody, paranoid and insecure young guy. But when I opened the door at the end, she walked out. And then when I walked in the, to the, into the sunshine, it was a sunny day. I walked into the sunshine, but sunshine entered me. It was like a bucket, bucket of liquid sunshine was poured into me as I walked out of the building. Not into it, as I walked out of the building. Bible says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I think in, I'd asked Jesus into my life a few times in that month previous because of the Christians. But I think I needed to get off my backside. I think I needed to get to church. But God didn't meet me in the church. He met me back on my territory. See, if he would have met me in the church, I think I would have had this thing in my head that, oh, well, God's in the church. And I need to be in the church to experience church stuff. And of course, that's not true, is it? That's Old Testament thinking. Because actually, we are the temple of, of, of the Holy Spirit. But God met me as I'm walking down the street, trying to roll a cigarette up. And it was just, Jane, this is real. I can feel his love. I felt enveloped by God's love. I knew that I knew that I knew I was saved. I was secure. I knew I had found what I didn't realize I'd been looking for. And I knew I'd never be the same again. All happened like that. Of course, it seems like that, doesn't it? But there is a process that leads to it always. But in that moment, I knew that I knew Jesus was real, that all this Bible stuff was real, and that it could be personal. Because I kind of had a belief in it, but I didn't know it could be personal. And this is when I started to understand that I'd been born again, that these born-again Christians, now it made sense. Ah, that's what it means to be born again, that actually the Spirit of God himself comes to live in you, and you start to partake of God's divine nature and you know who you are now because you don't know who you are until you know whose you are and I think that's a lot of people's problems nowadays isn't it they don't know who they are everyone's searching for something they find it in all kinds of tranquilizers and all kinds of things oh, I need something to make me feel uh, make me normal and whatever you don't know who who you are until you know whose you are and I knew whose I was oh no, it's not a bed of roses is it it's not easy if it was easy, I would have done it years before. It, but it's the truth. And I would rather have a hard truth than an attractive lie. And I don't get me wrong, the, the Christian way is full of joy, peace, and liberty, and all those things as, as we work it out. Um, but you have to carry your cross, don't you? It, it's, it's bittersweet. It, it's, you have to carry your cross, you have to persevere. You have to learn to be consistent. Because I was the most inconsistent person you could ever meet. But that's where the spiritual disciplines come in. And those are, uh, those are the things we've got to learn to do. Um, I, was, I read this article lately and it talked about the church being like a hospital. And I thought, mm, yeah, yeah, yes, and no. And then I thought to myself, and I don't know whether I read it or whether I thought it up myself. I like to think I thought it up myself, but I probably didn't. I thought it's more like an army hospital. Think of the difference. See, a hospital just makes you well for you. But an army hospital makes you well for a purpose. Do you get me? To fight the good fight. Because there is no, there is no spiritual Switzerland. <laughs> there is a spiritual battle everywhere. And you can't avoid it. And discipleship is the answer that we all need to grow and to overcome. Because the Bible says we're overcomers. But what I've learned is this is you have to learn to overcome. Now you overcome, of course, through Jesus. But the Bible says that we've got to work out. Our, you see, God works salvation into us. Because we can't do it. It's justification. God has to do it. Jesus died on the cross to save us. He did that. But we have to work it out. He works it in. We work it out with the Holy Spirit. So it's a partnership. It's not God doing it all, like just, I'm going to change Simon today. 
It's not. It's a partnership. It's an abiding relationship. But as we abide in him, he says, abide in me and you will bear much fruit. And that's what God's called us, to bear much fruit. Because that's the purpose. You see, a man with a purpose is a depressed man, isn't he? Generally speaking. Do you get my point? A man without a purpose is a depressed man. Because actually, you know, again, speaking generally, women are much more relationally driven. But we're much more purpose driven. I know there's exceptions, but we're much more purpose driven, aren't we? And we need a purpose to live for, to give our lives for. Because God has got great things, the Bible says, God has got great things prepared for us in advance, before the foundation of the earth. Good words prepared for us. So that's why I like that scripture that God has a plan and purpose or plans and purposes for us. And I've found that God has brought me into things that I could never imagined I would do. So I ended up, um, well, I, I, I was a welder for 17 years and sort of did some supervision, all kinds of things in that company that I worked for. Um, and that's really where I kind of learned really to sort of be a man, I suppose, and to work and to, you know, to be consistent because that was a tough, tough job. You know, on piecework every day, throwing heavy materials around and stuff. But then after 17 years, um, I got a job working in prisons with the Message Trust, being a prison outreach worker. And it was surreal. I, I kind of like, you know, when you've been working somewhere for so long, you can't imagine ever leaving. It was one of those days where I think, I'm going to give you a job. I've, only, I've, I've worked here since I was 17 and I don't know anything else. And, you know, it was a bit of a, a, a weird place to be at. But I gave it and then I worked in prison. And I worked in prison for another for 17 years. Well, I've worked for the message for 17 years. Worked in the prison for 10 years, rather. And then within a year, I was managing the project. So I worked in Hindley Prison. Ironically, the prison my dad was in when I was born. Can you see the foot fingerprints of God all over my life? I mean, I know it's your life as well, but you know, I'm speaking, aren't I? So, but you will see God's fingerprints all over your life. Look back. Look at the things that's happened. Even the bad things, God has used it for good. Why? Because the Bible says that God uses all things for the good of those called according to his purposes. Those who love him. I ended up working in Hindley where my dad was in prison when I was born. All those years before when she was 15 and had a baby, which was me. My dad was in Hindley. And I didn't look for prison ministry. It came to me. In fact, someone said to me, you need to go for that job. I went, no, I won't get it. He said, you need to go for that job. I was a youth worker at the time. Well, when I say youth worker, I wasn't getting paid. I was just voluntary youth, youth leader in the church, a small church I was in. And I did that for 15 years while I was working a full-time job. But all these things bring consistency in us, don't they? And I think consistency is one of the most underrated things. Consistent people are trustworthy people, aren't they? And that's what we want to be, isn't it? Certainly what I wanted to be. Because I never was. I wasn't. I was never consistent or trustworthy. But, I've, but God has taught me that through some hardships and difficult things. So don't despise some of the hard things you might be going through in your life. Because God is doing a work, always doing a work that will come to fruition. You know, the, the Bible says that don't give up because in due season we will reap a harvest. So I worked in prison for 10 years. And uh, I better bring this into land hunter, really. Okay, yeah, he's giving me the thumbs up. He's had enough now. I'm not coming here again. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, no, listen, I've been here twice and I've enjoyed the food and the company. It's been brilliant. I've loved it here. Um, and I love the seaside as well. But I didn't get to see any this time. We did last time. But um, seven years ago, um, I was doing prison ministry, coming to the end of it. So I worked in Hinley, Forest Bank, Thorn Cross in Warrington and Style Women's Prison on and off. And, you know, it just, I learned so much and, you know, it was an absolute pleasure to do that. I mean, it had its hardships. Of course it does. Nothing, nothing comes easy, does it? There was all kinds of spiritual battles to get things achieved that we wanted to do for God's kingdom and that. But we saw so many people getting saved. You know, I mean, serious criminals getting saved and coming to know Jesus. I mean, I could tell, and I won't, only because I haven't got time, but I could tell you stories and stories and stories of amazing things. In fact, you know, I'll tell you one. I was in the, I've got to tell this one because it's one that always stays with me. I met a boy, uh, he's from Wales actually, and that's why I'll tell this one. He's from Wrexham. He's called Wayne Williams. And he was brought up with a twin brother, brought up selling drugs at a young age, just taking them for his dad to different places and that. And he ended up in for stabbings and all that kind of stuff and ended up in, he ended up in Hindley Prison. He joined my Alpha course, got saved and, you know, on Sundays he'd come to the chapel services, raises his hands and worship 
It was beautiful to see. It was so pure. And this guy just had a childlike faith. No education. Uh, supported Liverpool, which is even worse. And just forgive me, I just had to get that one in because I know a lot of you are sympathetic to the Scouse cause, aren't you? Yeah, I thought so. I'm a bloomy, I'm a City fan. Man City, champions, come on. Anyway. <laughs> Um, I challenge anyone for a conversation about this one afterwards because you won't win it. Anyway, so um, w anyway, Wayne got saved, but one day he brings this mate of his in. Now, I, I knew who this boy was, he brought him because he was a bully. And he was the big head. He was the big head in Hindley when it was a, a YOI, that, you know, under 21s. And uh, this guy comes in and all I'm thinking of is this, I know this kid's brother's just been murdered recently. And I know that he's probably not going to want to hear us talking about a session on prayer and forgiveness and we need to forgive those because it can cause a blockage with our relationship with God and all I'm thinking of is what a day for him to turn up anyway he comes in and, and cut a long story short it is the alpha and it's the day I had to leave the group and I had to leave the group to do some admin work in the office so I wasn't in the alpha group my new guy was there <laughs> who'd only been doing prison ministry a number of weeks and all I'm thinking of is oh no Oh no, this has, got, this has got Strange Ways Riot written all over it. Because that happened in the chapel, the Strange Ways Riot. I know the details, and, and, and all I'm thinking of is, this has got all the ingredients. A disgruntled, unhappy guy who's now going to hear that he's got to forgive his enemies. No! And uh, anyway, I came out at brew time just to see how everyone was going. They were all having a brew and all chatting. No one was dead, so I went back into the room, I had to do my work, and at the end, I just quickly finished, and I got into the group, and again, it hadn't kicked off, and I'm like, because I've seen it kick off in prison, and it's not nice when it does, in chapel services I've seen it, but I, so I got into the group, and uh, I said to Wayne, I said, uh, everything okay? And he's with his mate, the big lad, you know, with a bald and, and he said, Simon, come here. So I came here, then he just walked away and left me with this lad, and all I'm thinking of is, what was this? And I turned around and said, uh, how's it going, Dave? And he said, yeah. Um, he said, I believe in this stuff, you know. He said, but how can I forgive the BASTRDs that did this to my brother? They stabbed him 23 times. And he described what they'd done to him. And it was worse than a horror film. And you know that moment where you think, how do I answer this? How on earth am I going to give an, an adequate answer? Now, this might sound simple, but when you're in the moment, you can't think simply. You just kind of think, oh, what can I do to say something that will make it sound okay and that God's worth following and all this? And, I, and he, he just said, how can I forgive them? And it was simple. And it was the Holy Spirit. I just said, I wouldn't be able to. No one could. Not in their own strength. But I know one thing, David. If Jesus Christ was in your life, only he could give you the power to forgive. Only he could give you that power. And it just made absolute sense to him. It was, and all I'm thinking of is, oh, thank you, Lord, because I would never have thought of that in the heat of the moment. And I said, David, let's go and sit at the back. So we went in. Now, the officers had come in, and the guys were ready to move back to the wings. So we had maybe two minutes where everyone was being patted down. So we, I thought, oh, well, we've got eight people going to be patted down. I'll be at the back with David. So I said, let's sit down. So we sat down. I said, David, can I pray for you? And he went, please do. And I laid my hand on him and said, Jesus, forgive him his sins. Come into his life. He wants you. He can't take this pain anymore. You know what he's going through. And, and they didn't let him go to his brother's funeral either. You know, that was, there was loads of factors in this. Um, you know, so, and with being a bully and being a hard lad and a reputation, I, I just, Lord, forgive me. You, you know that, Lord, that he just wants the right things. And you know the pain that he's going through. You know he can't handle this anymore. But you, please, come in. And then all I heard was the officer saying, right, okay. So I said, oh, we're going to have to go, Dave. So I walked in front of him. And he was behind me. And as I'm walking to the door, I felt a wave of emotion, just like I wanted to burst out crying. And it just overcame me. I just, I just got all weepy and teary, just out of nowhere. And then I realized, this is the Holy Spirit, something's happening. So I turn around, and David's weeping as he's walking to the door. And he just gets hold of me. He said, no one has ever done anything like this for me. Thank you. And just wept on my shoulder. This is a big, big lad. This is a bully lad. This is from a big family. This is a guy with a reputation. He went back to his wing. This is what I found out later. He went back to his wing, got in his pad, and he just cried out to God. He said, Lord, I've done nothing for no one. I've done nothing for you. I've done nothing nice in my life. But I just need you now because I can't take this anymore. 
And he said, and the presence of God just filled his room like, just like cotton wool. And he wept and cried like a baby and cried all the pain out. You know, you could have 20 years counseling to get you to that point. You might never get there. He had a moment with God and God did something amazing. So, you know, but anyway, when I finished working in prison, well, working in prison, I'll try and finish this now. I, 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 had, a, I had a moment with God. It was a burning bush moment, I call it. It was uh, 2004. 14, 2015, I was in one of our prayer days at the message. One, one, one day a month we have a prayer day where we down tools and we have a day of prayer, worship, testimonies, guest speaker and all that. Um, and this one particular day I went in and uh, my wife shared a picture from the front. So she works for the message too. And she shared this picture from the front about daffodils needing planting. We've got these bulbs we've never planted and they need planting or else they'll never become what they need to be. And she shared this word at the front of the building, just as the worship was just sort of like, sort of going quiet. She said, and I feel this, this is a word for people out here, she said. She's a very prophetic lady, my wife. And she came back to me, sat there, and she said, um, how did that come across? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm sure someone's going to take that message to heart, you know. It's the bulb story, everyone's heard that one, you know, Sunday school stuff. Um, and I said, yeah, if you felt to do it, you just got to do it, Jane, no matter if whatever. And she just said, that word's for us. And I just went, oh, I rolled my eyes because I knew what she was going to say. She wants to live in community with all these guys that come out of prison. I knew she was going to say something because she said it before. And she said, Simon, we're not going to be what God's called us to be until we get in there and live with people and create a home for people who haven't got a home. And I just thought, oh, this just doesn't fit in my life. I work in prison. When am I going to get the time? I, this doesn't fit. It's the wrong thing at the wrong time. It's, it's not for us. And then I just said, Lord, you're going to have to sort Jane out because she's trying to do too much. And... Uh, and I believe that. I wasn't being funny. I was saying, Lord, I can't take this anymore because she keeps saying it and it doesn't work. It doesn't fit. She's trying to do too much because she'll do anything for anything, my wife. So I just thought, Lord, you've got to deal with her now because this is now too much. She's doing stuff. I'm doing stuff. We haven't got, this doesn't fit. And then I just said, and what's more, Lord, is I'm not going back to Withinshaw because that's what she said. We've got to live in Withinshaw. And I hated Withinshaw because my first three years of pain and trauma were there. Stuff which has been buried. It's under, a, it's under a trap door in the bottom of the house kind of thing. It's in the cellar, and it's boarded up my first three years. So I said to the Lord, Lord, why should she keep going on about this? I'm within sure. Jane always hears from you well, but now she's got it wrong, Lord, and you need to stop her. You need to sort her out. I said, because, you know, I can't be doing with this anymore. I said, and what's more, Lord, is I could never go back to within sure. Have you noticed some of your best moments come when you're honest with the Lord? I do. That's when my tears and that's when I have breakthroughs when I start telling the Lord really genuinely how I really think and feel about things. God's not frightened of that, you know. I think he wants that more because he can deal with it and he wants us to be real and say if we think it's crap to tell him it. I've had my best moments when I've done that because then I can pour out my heart to the Lord and that's what the Bible says, pour out your heart to the Lord. So I, so I just said, Lord, I could never go back there. I couldn't take my children there. This is a rough place. It's a pe pe and then I said, a place of pain and trauma for me. And that was the moment where, poof, I just cracked open. I just started to cry uncontrollably and sob and snot and tears. And I dropped to my knees on the floor. And I had a holy moment with God. And I just said, Lord, I can't go back. And, I felt, and now at that point, I'd not been in Withinshaw for 40 years. I was 43 at the time. And I'd not been there since I was three. And you know what I felt the Lord say to me? In my mind's eye, you've got to go back to your people like Moses. And I hadn't realized it was 40 years. So I get up off the floor after five minutes of sobbing. And I got up to Jane. And I started trying to explain to Jane. I've had this moment on the floor. God spoke to me. I've got to go with him, sure. And, and suddenly she's like trying to get me to go with him, sure, for weeks. And suddenly now God just does it like that. And I said, Jane, I'm not crying. And she interrupted me and she said, Simon, like Moses, you've got to go back to your people. And I went... <laughs> straight back down on the floor sobbing uncontrollably but it was a beautiful pain anyway within months we had acquired the oaks someone paid for the oaks and we got this building and it's just finished now the project we've just closed we've, it's now a center of evangelism we've, we've opened it as a center of evangelism but i'm no longer sort of working i'm moving out and i've changed my role with the message and i'm in a bit of a transitional period but again, I mean, it's a great place to be, really, because it's, I know it's a new season for me. And God has new seasons for us. So I'm going to finish it there. But what I want to say is if any of you guys have not yet given your life to Christ, or 
maybe what's more prevalent when you speak in churches, maybe you've not surrendered to him properly and given him or, or made him Lord. Yeah, I, was, I was looking at, where is it now? Oh, there it is. Right, It was right there in front of me. Jesus is Lord. You know what Lord means? It means he's in charge of my life. Jesus is my Lord. That means that, means that I've surrendered and given my life to him because I know he can do greater things in my life than I could ever even dream of. The Bible says he can do more than we could possibly think or imagine. And I can imagine a lot, but he can do more. When we allow him to be Lord and give him our lives, our choices, our decisions, our career decisions, all these kind of things, the Lord can do wonderful things. Why? Because we're here to serve his kingdom. That's why I say it's like an army hospital. Because we're here to further his kingdom. And actually bring God, God's reign and rule and his influence into our spheres of influence. And God wants to shine through us. Some people might never read the Bible, but they'll read you. They'll read you. And you've got to be the Bible for them. A walking Bible. You've got to show the Lord Jesus. Because we do. We're like stained glass, like mosaics, where God wants to shine out of us and show people the great things that he's got for them. So if you're a Christian here tonight, and I would imagine there would be a few probably that, that can feel that, well, that's talking to me. If you've not fully surrendered your life, then I, I want to challenge you tonight to do business with God, to give him everything, to tell him everything, to confess it all, and surrender whatever the cost may be. And for some of you, that might be, you might have to give up something. You might have to admit to something. I worked in prison for years and there was a lot of people that needed to admit things. It says in Psalm 42, when I concealed my sin, my bones became dry and like a man in, this, in the burning sun. I've been that place myself as a Christian where I knew that there was things in my life which weren't right. And I had to confess them not only to God. But the Bible says confess your sins to one another. Why? That you may be healed. So I want to challenge you tonight, brothers, if there's any of you that you know Jesus is not Lord of your life because maybe there's bad habits or stuff or things you shouldn't be doing going on, I want you to surrender them to him tonight. And I'm going to stick around and if anyone wants to chat, talk or pray, then I'm sure there's me and a few leaders here which would be more than happy to pray with you and get beside you as brothers and not condemn you but actually bring you into where you need to be and help you. So I want to challenge you, but anyone who's not given their lives to Jesus, surrender it. Listen, you won't regret it because you will have, you, you will live life. Jesus said, I've come to give life and life in all its fullness. He said, the devil comes to steal, rob and destroy. That was our old master. That was our old boss. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life in its fullness to release you from the bondage of the past and for a greater life. So if you've not become a Christian tonight, do your business with God. Ask him to come into your life. Maybe do it when you get home. Maybe do it here. Maybe pray with someone. But do that. And for those of you that really need to walk, you know, in the light, I want to challenge you tonight. Because you've heard, even in, as I'm, I'm a broken person. I, I've got nothing of myself that's worth anything. But I have the most wonderful person in my life who makes me significant. Who gives me purpose. Who gives me meaning. Who gives me the power to change. And who gives me influence I could never have imagined. And he's took me places where I never would have gone. And kept me out of prison. <laughs> and much, 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 much more. So, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord, that you know me. The Bible says in Psalm 139, your thoughts towards us are as countless as the sand on the seashore. That you love us. That you have a plan for our lives. You knew us before we were born. You knew us when we were in our mother's womb. And you had good things prepared in advance for us. And tonight, Lord, as, as your church, as a bunch of people here tonight, we just want to say, Lord, take our lives. Do something amazing with them. Do what we could never do with them. Take us out of our small-minded, self-controlling lives and help us to give control to you and to allow you to become Lord of our lives. Help us, Lord, to walk in the light with our brothers because then we'll have fellowship with one another. Help us tonight, Lord, and help anyone that's struggling tonight, Lord, to have their breakthrough, Lord. Whether it's they need to talk to someone or just get prayer, I pray that for all they'll do their business tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. There's so much more I would have loved to have shared, but as you can tell, I can talk and too much, my wife always tells me, but I'll hand you back. But God bless. It's nice to be with you guys.
Um, Simon, that was great, fantastic. I was really encouraged. Um, I knew that you'd be great, but it's God that's great, isn't it? At the end of the day, it's God that's, um, he touches people's lives. And um, you mentioned something there about um, business. I was speaking to John on Sunday and he said one of my favorite sayings, God's in the business of transforming lives. That's what he does. He transforms lives. And there's people watching online as well. Um, I love this one line. And, and John, you, you experienced the power of... Sorry, John. Um, Simon, you experienced the power of God. When you walked out of that church, you experienced that liquid um, love of God. And I experienced that. So I always say either me and Simon are completely mad or maybe God's real. The millions of Christians around the world are completely mad to experience that. Or maybe God's real and he's worth looking into. Because how can I have the same experience that he had? And I used to live in Manchester, not far from Wivenshaw, when I um, as a non-Christian. We can have that conversation offline. <laughs> um, but yeah, really encouraged. Um, only men allowed. Great food, great encouragement. Um, if you're from another church, we don't want you to come to this church. We want you to go back to your church and to be fired up and encouraged. And to encourage the blokes as well. Um, next month, uh, last Friday of the month, uh, bring a friend. Um, if you've got any cash to put in the tin on the way out, it'd be greatly appreciated. If you haven't, go home blessed anyway. And if you can just give me a hand clearing the tables uh, and a quick tidy up with all the little things, that'd be fantastic. Guys, thanks a lot. And please speak to Simon um, if you'd like to um, go into the corner. And if God spoke to you tonight, don't go home without speaking to him. God bless, guys. Thanks a lot.